I mean, other David could also be wrong. I'm glad the one that's really clicking in my brain is not important, but here we go. Um, all right, let's talk about sorts very casually because that's apparently how we're going today and I'm totally here for it. So let's do it. Um, that's recording, right? Yes, cool. Why sort? Why do we need to sort? Um, sorts are going to be right? We have data that is unorganized. It would be better to organize that data so that we are able to more efficiently access it. Um, the, the, um, we can remove from it, we can find things faster, much more efficiently than we could if it were unsorted. And one of the things you're gonna see when we talk about search, things, uh, some searches are only going to work if our data is sorted. So um, before we talk about searching, we talk about sorting. We have to figure out how to sort things. Sorting has proper things that you're going to learn, we're not really going to touch a ton on, is you can do sorting in multiple, like you can sort by one thing and then sort by another, um, or one per property and then another property. It's something that, uh, you know, you have the potential and it's kind of, kind of uh, be a stable and stable sorts. And that's something we're going to talk about here in, in just a minute. So, so we need to classify the different types of sorts that we have, right? We have to, we're gonna have a bunch of different sorts. Um, and in order to kind of compare them against one another, we have to talk about some of the differences they have. So you're gonna see this nice lovely chart that David's put together here in a minute that uh, throws together the differences between some of the sorts we're gonna talk about today. And we're gonna talk about their runtime complexity, uh, which we've kind of touched on over the past few days when we you know, have been talking about Go. Um, that's going to be one of the most important is how it's going to take the execution sort uh, and how what the what its big city is and uh, uh, being able to run it also is going to be space complexity we have to talk about uh whether or not the place is done or the sort is done in place or out of place um you guys have read up a little bit using tools someone talk a little bit about the difference between in place and out of place sorting I'm going to put that in. Slack. Sorting while uh, out of place kind of breaks up the elements and takes them kind of out of place while it's doing the sorting to bring them back together eventually. Cool. Yeah. We're going to store data. If we have uh, certain sorts like uh, where we have to store data in separate arrays while we are holding on to it and then take that data and put it back into a different array, uh, it's going to take up more space. Basically, something we have to be cognizant of. Um, this Mac is freaking out. Okay, we're good now. I don't know what just happened there. Um, another way to ask is um, whether it's a comparison sort or whether it's distribution uh, that along with stable or unstable, uh, which are two things that we're both going to talk about in the next uh, kind of slides. Um, these are, are going to be whatever it is we want to accomplish. Space, let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, we just talked about the differences between input and out of O1 or O log N. So it's a, either uh, linear or logarith logarithmic. Um, the reason that it is going to be uh, that for in place is because for every, we're going to have one thing to do, right? It's not going to be as time intensive uh, as if uh, potentially take data 
and put it in another place and then take data and put it back. Um, that make out of place sorting a little bit less efficient, which makes sense, right? If we're able to um, move elements around in an array, we don't necessarily need extra space for that array. So the space complexity of that is going to be less intensive than if we were to have a second array where we're moving things back and forth from one array to a second array. And it's just, there's more operations involved there. I take longer to execute that. Compare versus distribution. It, it does exactly what it is. It's right. Each item is going to determine items to say, okay, which one is going to go first? And if it's already in place, then you leave it. If not, then you switch them. And we're going to see some examples of this here in a minute. Um, some of the examples of this, as you think about them, are alphabetizing, right? If you put things in alphabetical order, you're going to need to make a determination and say, oh, before this or after it. And if they're in the wrong order, you would switch them. That's going to be a comparison sort. Um, we talk about distribution sorts. We're going to be using uh, properties of items to determine how they're sorted. So we can be putting them in essentially different categories or different places. Uh, it's not necessarily any worse than a comparison sort. It's just different different sets of data. And then we're going to be covering talking about sorts is that one sort isn't necessarily always better, for example, than uh, another sort. It just kind of depends on A, what kind of data you have, and B, what you're trying to do with that data. So you just kind of have to take a number of different factors into account when you determine what sort to use. And one of the um, uh, our David uh, said when we were uh, when he was doing a spiel last night. I think he's actually covered covered that in both of his little talks. Is you don't necessarily need to know how to write code for a single type of sort. You know, a lot of people when they go into job interviews and technical interviews and things like that, they think, oh God, I have to know all the sorts and I have to know all the code for all the sorts. And that's absolutely not what you need. If you have a base understanding of how these things work, you don't need to know how to reproduce the code for all of them. Because you're going to see when we get to merge sort here in a bit, the code for it is not, it, it's a little intimidating. Uh, we're going to talk about recursion today, which is big and scary and crazy. And it's going to blow some of your minds. Um, but you don't necessarily have to know exactly how the code operates for all the different types of sorts. But just being able to kind of generalize and say, OK, this sort is has this uh, time and space complexity, then you'll have a better understanding of when to use that sort. And that's kind of the big takeaway for this stuff. Uh, it's also the reason we're not going to go into specific examples of exactly what the code looks like for every single sort. We're going to dig in a little bit deeper with merge sort uh, because it's a, a good one to dig into because we also get to talk about recursion. But it's not something where we're, we're not going to go over the exact code for all the different types of, of sorts. That's something y'all can do on your own, should you want. Um, the other fact that we need to talk about is whether a sort is stable or unstable. And uh, I, I didn't pull up the GA module, but I have another picture I can show you here in just a second. Um, stable sorts preserve the relative order of a collection when they are sorted. Uh, they're described as having stability. Um, the GA materials do a great job with that. Y'all watch that, right? The cards and putting the cards in order. And when you just put all of the cards in order from ace all the way to king, that is putting them in just a base order. But if they're organizing them by suit, you want to be able to keep them in number order and in suit order at the same time. That would be preserving the stability of a, uh, of a sort. And there is a chart that kind of exemplifies that. Um, I will show you here. I'll share this screen. So this is a kind of the 
create the in front of the two relatively or like relative to one another, they're still in the same order. Order. So that would be an example, uh, which you're going to see here when we get to selections, potentially switch orders. And this would be just the changing their position. Um, so that's, again, just giving a, a ballpark feel for what that looks like, because we're going to talk about it again here in a minute. Share this one again. Keynote close. There we go. Okay. So stable sorts are going to preserve that relative order of a collection when they're sorted. Um, to add on to this, is the original order that the data was received? Um, important. Um, if we have two of the same number, does that do those two numbers? Does the order of those two numbers matter to us? If it is important, then we need to make sure that whatever sort we're using is stable. If it's just two number twos and what the heck, there's no difference between the two of those, then that sort doesn't, you wouldn't necessarily need to use a stable search. So it's just one of those factors that you kind of have to think about when you're determining which search to use. Uh, unstable sorts, uh, again, very important to realize, they're not inherently worse than stable sorts. Sometimes sta unstable sorts are going to be faster at accomplishing what you want to, want to do. It's just gonna depend on, again, what kind of data you have and what your, your goal is in your sort. Um, they just have a different behavior, here, right? You're potentially gonna be switching elements that are uh, being sorted the same way. Like if you had two different eights, for example, in an example like you just saw, what these could potentially switch position, which if we're just using an array of numbers, doesn't matter. Um, but if there are going to be other sorts done down the road with other properties or the, um, the other properties matter, then you would want to consider using the stable of a rental sort. Um, sometimes unstable sorts can be more time efficient, um, but it just, again, it depends on what you're looking for when you're when you're trying to get this done. <laughs> David threw this in there. This is the an answer to the age old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Uh, we're using a sort method to do that. Parent chicken though. Haha, uh -huh, funny. Let's sort. Let's do sort. Let's sort. Um, the first one that we're going to talk about is a selection sort. Uh, this is ugly. This is this is a bad sort, but we have to start somewhere, right? This is the one that you're probably going to have seen before, right? We're going to search for each of these different sorts. We're going to show you the pseudocode, and then you're going to have a nice little flashy example. Numbers fly around from places to place um, so that you can kind of get a feel for what each of these things looks like in, in it actually being executed on a array of numbers. Um, so, but before we do that, we have to talk about the pseudocode. What's going to happen here? We are moving, moving numbers around. So for a selection sort, we're going to say while unsorted, so there's going to be some sort of loop here, right? There's going to be loops for all these. We are going to search iteratively through the unsorted part of the data and find the lowest value. Then we're going to take that smallest value and we're going to swap with the unsorted and that's now going to be a sort part of the array. So let's see this in action. This. Okay. okay. What we need to do is search through the array and find the lowest value. Five is, okay, we have a five. Let's compare five and the three. Which of those is lower? It's the three, right? So we're going to hold on to the three. The three. No different. I'm going to hold on to that three, right? Because it's the second three is not within the. So we're going to compare that three to the two.
two is less than three. So we're now going to hold, we're going to realize that those the lower determines that the number available in our array is a one. So pew, we're going to take that one, we're going to swap it with the uh, first element of the unsorted segment. So now have that element at the, at the front of the array. Right? That is now so nice looking color. Next step, go through the, the steps again. We're going to start at the top of the loop again. Okay? Search iteratively, iteratively, iteratively through the unsorted part of the data and find the lowest value. Start with the three. Compare the three and the three. No difference. You can stick with the three. Compare the three and the two. We have a winner. We check the two. Compare it to the five. Still lower. Compare it to the four. Still lower. So now we know we know that the two is our our winner for this round, right? It's going to get swapped with the front of the array, unsorted array. Now that's sorted. This is how a selection sort works. We're going through those steps every single time, and we are looking at every single value multiple times, right? Um, and then piece by piece, we're shrinking down our available numbers that still need to be sorted. So that's just going to stay in place. Compare the three and the five. Compare the three and the four. We know that the three is the least, so we put it at the front. Then we look at the five, compare it with the four, and we switch them and put them both in their place. And so this one was unstable then, correct? Yes. Why? We saw our two different threes get swapped in with uh, like the two instead of just pushing the other three back. See, David, my class is on top of this stuff. David's class got that part wrong. In fact, they called him out for this being a stable sort when they were completely wrong. So air high five, Corey, great job. You're smarter than all of David's class put together. Yeah, we'll say uh, help, the extra help of going to David's stuff at night is definitely worth it. <laughs> Apparently, there's just something mag magical about having the name David and going over CS stuff. So cool. Or uh, just as, the process of uh, going over it multiple times. Who knows? Hey, it's it's like reps actually help you learn the material. I wonder if uh, I, sh I should have told you guys that at the beginning of the course. It's magical. I know, right? So as you can see, the uh, stability is listed as unstable, uh, as Corey pointed out. This is a comparison sort. Uh, time complexity. The best case time complexity for this is going to be n squared, right? It's going to be quadratic. Because for every single one of those items, we're going to have to go through multiple times. And that is going to be the average and the worst case. So you can see this isn't a very efficient sort as far as time complexity goes. Space complexity, it's great, right? Because we don't need to move, we're just moving things around. We don't necessarily need extra space um, to store variables while we're making determinations. So this is relatively um, uh, good as far as space complexity goes, but the time complexity absolutely sucks. So let's talk about bubble sort. And bubble sort, our pseudocode is a little bit more complex. These are going to get more and more complex. And when we eventually get to merge sort, it, it, it's, I'm just bracing you now, it's going to get sticky. Uh, we have a code example. We're going to walk you through it. It's going to be fun. It's actually the reason this lecture is going to take so long, because we're going to step by step go through exactly how merge sort works. Um, but with bubble sort, we start by creating a swap counter. And we're going to set that counter equal to a non-zero number. Um, what we're going to do is until that swap counter finishes its cycle, which I'm going to describe in a second, equal to zero, we are going to look at each adjacent pair in the data set. If the two pairs are not in order, we're going to swap them. And we're going to increment, increment that swap counter by one. So it might sound a little complex, right? But let's let's see it work. That's why these little animations are fantastic. That's why we use Keynote for this instead of just doing this all in, uh, in Notion. So here's our numbers again. We're starting off our swap counter equal to a non-zero number. The reason that it's set to a non-zero number 
uh, is because we are going to be iterating through um, this process and we're going to have some sort of check to see whether or not our swap counter is equal to zero uh, at the end of a cycle. So we're going to set it equal to one for this first, uh, this first iteration. So let's go through our list. First step is to set the swap counter equal to zero. So we do that. Next, we're going to look at each adjacent pair. We're taking the five and the three and we're comparing them. Are those in order? They're not. So we swap them and we increment our swap counter. Next thing we do is we are going to look at the five and the three. Are they in order? No. So we increment our swap counter and we swap the values. Next, compare those two. Are they in order? Nope. Go ahead and swap them, increment the swap counter. Keep going, keep going. The reason this is called a bubble sort is because do you see how that five just bubbled up to the back of the array? Your items are going to bubble as they go and that they bubble, right? That's why this is called a bubble sort, okay? I was wondering about so, that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's fun watching um, uh, like animations of how this stuff works because you actually get to see that things are kind of like bubbling. It's hard to describe, but if you see it actually happening, it's, it's really fun to watch. And in fact, that little video I shared with y'all last night and uh, I'll share it again later, but um, it's, a, it's a good visual representation of how all these sorts work, which is actually really kind of fascinating. Um, yeah. In, a, in the class channel, there's, David has a little graph that shows it all too, it's really cool. We have finished this iteration, right? So we're going to, there's my annotate button. Again, set the swap counter equal to zero because we're starting a new, a new it cycle through this loop, right? So we're gonna set this equal to zero and then we're going to go through our process again. We're going to start with our two threes. If they're not in order, swap them. There's no determination to be made there. So then we look at the three and the two. They need to be swapped. So we set our swap counter equal to one greater than it was before. The three, the three now is bubbling up, right? Now we compare those. Now we know the four is in order. Okay. So the next Step through this, we've set our swap counter back equal to zero, start at the beginning again, make our determination, okay? We had to switch those, so increment the swap counter. Got to switch those, increment the swap counter again. Don't need to switch those, so we know that's in order. Start again, zero. Do we need to switch those? Yep. Okay, do we need to switch those? Nope. So we know that one's in order. Now we start, here's where things get interesting, right? We're gonna keep that swap counter equal to zero because that's how we start our loop. We make our determination here and they're in order. We don't need to swap them. So the swap counter is gonna stay at zero. So we know that these two items are both sorted. That is how a bubble sort works. That last little bit, like, actually seeing like the counter and realizing how it works really actually helped I think the most on this than anything else I've seen. You can thank David Stinson for that. He's the one that built all of this. So, okay. so let's talk about the characteristics of a bubble sort. Uh, our best case scenario. Why is our best case scenario here N? Who can kind of posit a guess as to why this would be n and not n squared. Think about your big O. What condition, looking at, looking at an array of numbers, what condition would lead to a best case scenario of wouldn't, n time complexity? Wouldn't it just be that they're automatically all in place and therefore you just have to iterate through it once? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. If all of the numbers are in place already, we're just looking, we're just, we, have, we get to go through it once. So it's going to be a time complexity of however many things there are in the array, which is n. Worst case scenario, you have to check every single one of those every single time, which would be n squared. 
right? Excellent. Also in place, right? Because we're not using a temporary placeholder array. Um, this one is going to be stable because we're not going to be swapping things in place of each other, right? We're only going to be bubbling things up. There's no situation where I take a, uh, if I have two different threes, there's no situation ever where those threes are going to switch place because of the way that the sort works. So this would be a stable sort. Any questions on bubble sort? Bubble sort's still not super efficient, but it's better than selection sort as far as, well, in, so, in some situations. We good on bubble sort? Cool. Which one's next? Insertion sort. Okay. This one, here's our pseudocode. What we're going to do here is we're going to say whatever the first array item in the array is, we're going to say that it's it's sorted. It's living in its new home. That's it. It's in place, right? And while the array is unsorted, we're going to look at the next unsorted element. And we're going to make a determination and say, is this higher or lower than the one that's already been sorted? And we're going to find the appropriate location for it and pop it into that location. So let's see this in action. There's our magical little array of numbers. So we're going to start off saying the five. That's it. Five's in place. Five sorted. We're going to count that as sorted. Okay. So while unsorted, we're going to look at the next unsorted element. That's a three. Okay. We're going to evaluate where that three needs to go in our sorted array. We see that because three is less than five, it goes there. We now consider that sorted. Next, we're going to take the next item in the unsorted part of the array, make a determination. We know that it needs to go between the three and the five, because that's how numbers work. <laughs> Next, we go to the number two. We determine three, three, five, two is less than all of those. So two is going to go. We have to slide all those over. And then two is going to go right there. Okay. Then we look at the one. We know that one is going to go before all those numbers. So we slide them over. Put the one there. Now the one is sorted. Then we pull up the four. We determine that the four goes here. So you have to iterate over for like the last number, you have to iterate over that, like for example, the one, right? You have to iterate through every single number because it's not holding anything. Right. Okay. We have to make that check on every single number. Okay. I, sh I should have been more explicit about that when I was walking through this. You're comparing that number to every single other item as you're sliding them all over to make that check. Yeah, and if it's bigger, it goes to the right. If it's smaller, it goes to the left, right? Like I, I remember like uh, David mentioning that, that last night as well. Now our four is locked in place and we're good. So let's talk about the insertion sort. Again, time complexity. If we are given an array of numbers that's already in order, our data set is already in order, our best case scenario is we're not going to need to sort anything. We're good, right? That's, that's what makes that selection sort even crappier, right? Because even if our data is in order, we still have to go through and check every single thing. And, and it's just, it's horribly inefficient when it comes to time complexity. Uh, but with the insertion sort, it's also going to have an average and worst case scenario of n squared, okay? It's also in place. You saw that it was stable and it obviously is a comparison sort. Okay, I guess you guys don't get that because you don't know she's odd so um <laughs> oops <laughs> um he sings a song called we can do better than this it's a song about javascript and you, you're telling me there's not a video of it we can watch you there is just... it's, oh, yeah. go ahead. there is a video but we'll, I'll, i'm gonna I'll say next time you. next time you get to that slide just be like get it and then move on to see if anyone admits to not understanding it. I should. This is the fun one that we're going to learn today. This is merge sort. And we're going to get to see a really, really cool example of this. 
um, I'm gonna show you guys how to set up breakpoints in VS Code so that you can I essentially iterate through your code line by line. And it's like putting a pause button on running your code, which is really, really neat. So merge sort, here's our pseudo. The pseudocode is not very intimidating. Um, when we look at the pseudocode, it's just, okay, we're just gonna sort the left half, we're gonna sort the right half, and then we're gonna merge and sort the two halves. That sounds easy, right? I could write that code, but there's more to it than that, right? So let's take a look at how merge sort works in a picture and a diagram with the fancy animations. And then I'm gonna pull up my code on the screen and we're gonna walk through it in an actual code example. Cause I think this one's really important for you to see. So here we've got our array of what? Eight numbers. We are going to start by breaking them in half. Then exactly like we said, right? We're going to take those numbers, break them in half. Then we're going to evaluate the left side. The left side, we, since we have more than just single elements here, we have more, like we're eventually making, trying to make a comparison between two elements. So until we get to the point where we just have two elements to compare, we have to keep breaking things in half. So we're gonna break this in half again and say, okay, I'm gonna look at the left side first. Left side has more than two elements, right? It, or it's, it's more than one element. So we have to break it in half again, break it in half. Now we are able to make a determination, right? Is one greater or less than the other? We can see that these are out of order. So we're gonna switch them. And now we're good. Now we get to go and evaluate the right half. Do we have single elements? No, we have to break them apart. Okay, we break them apart. Then we have to check, make sure they're in order. They are, so we're gonna put them in order. Then, now that we have two of these halves, we can go back and th this is where recursion is gonna kick in, right? We're gonna be passing this function or passing this array to itself in another function uh, or in the same function. You're gonna get to see an example of recursion. So now that we have these sorted halves, we need to merge them back together. So the next step is to compare the front of both the, the first element of each of these arrays, right? doesn't matter, they're both threes. So we're just gonna take the first three, pop it there. Next step, compare the first element of both arrays, the three and the four. So the three goes down. Next step, compare the first element of both arrays. The four goes down. Next element, or if there's only one element left, so we just know the seven slides down. We've taken care of the left half, right? Now we need to take care of the right half. Are we, Single elements, no, break them in half. Left side first, are we a single elements? No, break them in half. Now we have single elements, so we make our determination and compare them. The one is the lowest, so it goes in first, then the two. Now we have that part sorted, so we can move on to the right half. Single elements, no, break them apart. Now we make our comparison. Five is less than six, so we're good. Now that we have our two sorted arrays, left half and right half, we are going to merge them together. That's so why it's a merge sort. So we compare the first part of both arrays, first element of both arrays, our one goes in. Now we compare, our two goes in. And now we know, because we've only got one array left, that both the five and the six are just gonna get essentially concatenated onto the end of that array. That's how this is gonna actually look in code. So now, again, we have a sorted left half and a sorted right half, so we're gonna merge them together. So compare the first element of both arrays. That's where our one comes in. Now we know that's in place. Then our two, then our three, then our three, then our four, then our five, then our six, and our seven. This doesn't look that difficult when you look at the animation, but the code is a little bit overwhelming, which is why we're gonna spend so much time on it because we're gonna to have to talk a little bit about recursion. We haven't really talked about that yet. How do we feel about the animation? Does that, do you guys wanna see it again? Do you think that did a good job of 
demonstrating the flow here. Talk what would, what is the time complexity on this? In, We're going to talk about it. that here in a minute. Okay. Because well, it's, I mean, it's right here, right? It's going to be n log n, so it's going to be better time complexity. I guess I would need to see how it would be more time because it looks like it takes a shit ton of time because it looks like you have to go through everything like multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, I'm struggling to see why it exists, but I'm sure there's a reason. Yeah. The recursion is going to save you time because you're breaking it into smaller parts and organizing things in smaller parts. It's just, it's, I guess it's hard to explain why. Yeah, I just got to see not, the code. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about the code here in just a second. Um, it's, go ahead. As you're going through this, think like, because you're able to break your problem in half every single time you're doing your problem, that is what makes this log in. And then because you have to iterate over it to make it work, that's what makes it in log in. So that that is where you're getting your time complexity savings. It, like if you break it down into an animation like this, yeah, this takes longer to like animate. But if you think about like, hey, Every single time I have a problem, I'm breaking that problem into uh, into halves. So every, for all of your iteration that you're doing, you're dealing with half of the problem that you would have been dealing with otherwise. That's what the time complexity savings comes in here. And even You'll though, we're, go ahead. Uh, even though we're like, right, splitting the problem because we're splitting the problem to smaller problems, it takes less time to do each problem. And because with Big O, you ignore everything else that is the same time complexity. That's why you get the savings. Exactly, yep. Okay. Any, ex most examples where you are just, you're cutting the problem in half is going to have logarithmic complexity. So, uh, and just like David mentioned, because we have to do that for the number of elements in the array, that's where the first end comes from. If the log in piece of this isn't necessarily making sense to you right now, it'll make a whole lot more sense to you whenever you actually see searching, uh, because you're uh, going to have a more direct like view into, oh, we're breaking a problem in half. That is what's making this take less time. So like, if that is the piece that's like, wait, why does breaking this problem in half, how, why does that work? Then you'll see that here whenever you all cover search in like 20 minutes. Yeah, that's going to be more than 20 minutes, but <laughs> yeah, uh, it's going to take a bit to go over this code. So, um, cool. Well, that is, that is that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to show you, maybe I'll stop sharing. If I can find my mouse pointer. Um, I'm going to show you an example of the code. So again, I know this is going to look a little scary. It's OK. Move all of your faces over here. Um, what I want to show you is, oh, these breakpoints not. Oh, that's why it's doing it. Sorry. Um, before we get into the code, I want to show you a really neat feature of VS Code called the de debug mode here. There's run and debug. So what you can do is you can set up what are called breakpoints. That's what these little circles are. And you can essentially step by step go through your code and look at the state of your application or your program as it's running to see what different variables are. So what I've done is I've set up different breakpoints here throughout this code so that we can constantly evaluate, like step through the code bit by bit and make different evaluations as we go. So you're gonna see here, if I go to run and debug, that it starts off here. I know this looks intimidating, but just give me a second. Um, we are watching several variables. So as I step through this code, you're gonna be able to see here 
that different things here change, right? Now we've determined our right, middle index, left, right, different things are going to be happening here. So that's something to be expected while we go through this. Essentially what's happening here is we're stepping through this code bit by bit, instead of just like instantly running the code and coming up the result, it is going to step-by-step step go through this code, right? Because if we just run the code, you'll see, um, it gives us our sort of final sorted array, right? It just works. That happened lightning fast, but we don't want to do that. We want to step-by-step go through this so we can see every little piece that's happening. Um, our unsorted array here is 43371256. So this is what we're starting off with, okay? We're going to say const sorted array equals merge sort unsorted array. So we're passing this array in to our merge sort, and we're going to console log the sorted array when we get done. This is what is executing our code, okay? So this is what we're starting with. This is the function to sort it, and this is what we're console logging at the end. So I want to go up here and let's talk about merge sort. So the merge sort is going to be a recursive function. There's going to be recursion happening in here. And a recursive function is going to have three parts, forever and always. It's going to have a base case. And the base case is what allows you to exit the recursive function. If you write a recursive function and you don't have a base case, you're going to get what? Errors. Well, there'll be an error, infinite loop. Yes, if you don't have a way to exit your recursion, like if your recursion isn't, you don't tell it when to stop, it's just gonna keep going. So our base case here is if the array's length is less than or equal to one, okay? You're gonna see why that's important here in just a moment. The second part of a recursive function is the action. Okay, it's something that happens to move towards your base case. So your goal in the action is to make something happen that gets you closer to your base case. Again, if your action doesn't make you get closer to your base case, you're gonna have an infinite loop and your code's just gonna continue to run. And then the third part is the recursion. It's a function that's calling itself. So you're gonna see here that we have const left sorted, const right sorted, equals merge sort. So we're calling this merge sort again on these individual functions or on these individual arrays that we're trying to sort. You're gonna see this happen as I go through it. But again, the three parts to a recursive function, base case, action, recursion, bar, B-A-R. And a quick way to remember that, thanks to Crystal Vasquez of one of my previous cohorts, is that recursion, when you think about it, makes you want to go to the bar. So something to think about, right? Because it hurts your brain, makes you want to go drink. So um, let's take a look at what we've got here. If array.length less than equal to one, return array, okay? So why is that important? Look at our recursion here. We're gonna skip this left and right and ju for just a second. We're gonna skip this stuff in the middle. Our merge sort here, we're going to keep running merge sort on our array until we get it down to the point where it is one item or less in length. Why the less? Why isn't this just array equals one? Because we're not always going to be sorting an even set of numbers. So if we had seven, one side is going to have one and the other side will still have two. Exactly. So we're going to have to check to make sure that it's less than or equal to one. That way, if we end up with something where we have essentially a zero, if we split something and there's only one part of it, this still ends up working. We'd have a bug if we didn't put that. So we're gonna constantly go through this array until it sorts down to just two individual parts. And those two individual parts are going to be left sorted and right sorted. So once we have gotten down to that point where we have those two parts, we're going to pass both of those parts to a merge function. This, this merge function is our helper function. All this merge function does is it takes the, remember how we, we had the two arrays and we compared the first value of each one and then kept moving up the one that was in, supposed to be in the right place. That's what our merge function does. 
okay? While left array dot length and right array dot length. So while we still have items in our array, if the item in left array at index zero is less than or equal to right array index zero, push it into uh, our result array. Also notice here we're using shift. So shift is going to remove the item from the left array and push it into the result array. So this is essentially going through our two arrays that we pass to it, whatever, if we pass it, two arrays of two items, right? Two, well, if you pass it an array of one number, an array of one number, it's just gonna compare those numbers and put them in the right order. If we pass it two index or two arrays with two indexes each, it's gonna compare the first thing on each of those and then put the correct one in the new array, right? Then you've got a one and a two. Then it's gonna compare the first item to one of them and then whichever one's in the right order, it's gonna put in there. It's just gonna go through and just pick off individual items and put them in the right order. That's what's happening here in this merge helper function. We good on that? This is the least confusing part of this code, I think. So let's start by stepping through this and see what happens, okay? The first thing that we do, we're gonna go run and debug. We also get to talk here about the call stack. So if I click on this, uh, well, you, I guess you don't really get to see anything quite yet, but you'll notice that there's one merge sort in what's called the call stack. This is gonna be the order of operations that our code runs. When we deal with, we haven't really had to deal with this yet because uh, we haven't had multiple things running at the same time as far as the same function running multiple times. Uh, but with recursion, the call stack is very important because what's gonna happen is when we pass that array, the, our eight index array into this function, let's see what happens. Right now we're at this point, right? This little highlighted yellow. So middle index equals math.floor array.length array length over two, okay? So what we're doing here is we're finding the midpoint of the array. So if I step to the next point, you're gonna see that our middle index here is four. Okay, so next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna break our array into parts. We're gonna have array.left and array.right, or excuse me, left and right. So we're going to slice that array, zero index up to the middle index, and we're gonna store that as left. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the array, we're gonna slice it from the middle index to the end of the array, and we're gonna store it in right. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna do, this is where the recursion is gonna happen. So we're going to run merge sort again on the left part of this array, right? Because that's the next line of code. What's gonna happen here is that because we are running merge sort again, this function as we know it is just be essentially being put on pause because we have to wait until this has been evaluated in order to run this next line, this right sorted, this right sorted isn't gonna run for a while, but figuratively speaking, right? Um, it's gonna take a minute because we have to go through this again. So you're gonna see when I push this button, what happens is because we're adding another instance of this function, it's gonna get put into what's called the call stack. So when I hit that button, we now have two things in our call stack. And if we click between them, we can see that this call stack where we have our initial state, we still have left, we still have right, we still have our middle index. But if we look at the merge sort that we just started, right, that's on top in the call stack, that's when we take that left array. Remember this, we have our left array and we pass our left array to merge sort. In this call stack, that left array is now being passed to merge sort again. So we have a whole nother instance of merge sort running and it's been put on our call stack. Think of call stack like, I mean, it's a stack, right? We're gonna learn about stacks and queues, but when you stack things up, you have to be able to remove them in the order that you stack them. You can't pull something from the bottom of a stack. That's not how it works. That would be a queue. So think of this piling up functions that we need to run and we can't get to the function beneath until the function up top is done running. So what, with recursion, what's happening here is we're just making, essentially piling up all of our functions 
until we get to the point where we have single arrays. So arrays with one element, then we can make that comparison. And then this finishes running so we can go to the one beneath it. And then that one beneath it continues to run until we have what we need. Then we can go to the one beneath it. So we're essentially just making a pile of code to run here. This can be kind of hard to wrap your brain around. I get it. If, if you're like confused right now, that's okay. If you watch this lecture again a couple of times, you'll, you'll get it. Just read up on how recursion works and how it pertains to the call stack. But what we did in our first part of the call stack, our first merge sort, is we sent that left half of the array to another merge sort. So let's watch what happens with that. We're passing in this 4337, right? So we take a step, middle index is two, right? And we take a step, we're determining the left and right halves of that array. And then our next step is pass it again to left sorted. We're gonna pass this left four and the three to left sorted. Poof, now we have another call stack on the merge sort or merge stack on the merge sort on the call stack, right? Because we have to take that other array and pass it again. It's more recursion, right? So we find the midpoint. We have a left, we have a right. Then what happens? We have to, again, we're passing it again. But what happens when we pass it this time? We're returning the array because it's now one element. So you're gonna see one of these merge sorts get knocked off the call stack. Well, it's technically happening twice here. And now we are merging we get to run this part of it. This is the first time that our right sorted gets to run. And we're gonna pass to it the three because the three is what's being stored in the right half of that array. Remember we split this four and three. So left sorted came back with a four. And you're gonna see when I step through this that the right sorted will now come back with a three. So we've broken this down into individual elements. So what happens next? We're going to return merge left sorted, right sorted. So take a step. So this is the first time that this while loop runs, right? This is our merge. We've established a placeholder array with nothing in it, which is what you see here. We've passed to it left array and right array. So you can see both left array and right array here. And we're gonna step through this. The first thing that happens is if left array index zero less than or equal to right array index zero, which we're going to push, it's not. So we're gonna push right array dot shift into the result array. Now it's in the result array. Then we go through this again. Is this a true statement? This is truthy. Left no. array dot length. All right. No, um, because uh, the right array has an empty space in there now. No. Cool. So we concatenate the two arrays, which is exactly uh, what's happening here. Now we see. Um, why do you not have to use the spread operator here? Because you're you're pushing an array, or is that dot sh shift getting it out? The dot shift okay. cuts it. The dot dot shift is going to return the it, okay. it actually returns the value. Okay, so now we've ret we're returning our result, which is the sorted piece, our first sorted piece of our array. Okay, poof. So we go back up here, and we see now that we've got this is what's being returned is the four and the three. So since we're returning this, we're going to go back again one step on our call stack. So one of those goes away. And now we have to run right sorted. Now, we, since we've sorted the left half of that first section of the first array, we get to go to the right sorted. You'll remember the right, we've got a three and a seven because we're started with this four, three, three, seven, right? Our main array, we had the big thing. We split it left and right. Then inside of this first call stack or second call stack item, we have the four, three, three, seven. We split the four and the three, and then we sorted them. Now we have to split the three and the seven and sort them. So we step through this, finds the midpoint, 
puts one in the left, one in the right. Passes them. Returns each of the arrays, which put them into left sorted and right sorted. And now that we have those, we merge them. So our merge function goes in, determines the order, puts them in order. Three and seven is what's get re what gets returned. Now that we have back to this, we have left sorted and we have right sorted, but now they're each index uh, or have indexes of two, right? Or two elements in them each, I should say. So that we have the three, four, three, seven. We've sorted those two arrays. So we passed in four, three, three, seven, which is out of order. Now we've put half of the array in order, half of the array in order. And now we're going to merge those results back together. So we go down to our merge. And you're going to see, watch this result pile up here. It's going to compare the three and the three. Three is smaller. And then it compares the three and the four. Three is smaller. Compares the four and the seven. And then since we only have one thing left, it pops the seven in there. OK. Now we have left sorted, three, three, four, seven. So now that the left sorted is finished running, we get to run the right sorted. So we're going to have this one, two, five, six. This is going to be great because they're already in order. But if we step through this, finds the midpoint, separates them out. We still have multiple elements in the array. So we're going to take that one and the two, find the midpoint, split them out. Then we pass each of those to our merge function, which splits them, puts them in order, one, then the two, returns them. That is now left sorted. Now that we have left sorted, we go for right sorted. So it takes them, splits them. Da -da -da -da. Puts them in order. Returns them. We have left sorted, we have right sorted. So we're going to take those, pass them to the merge, and then the merge is going to put them in order. We got the one. And we've got the two. And then we've got the five and the six. The five and the six were concatenated because we knew they were already in order. Let me go back a couple steps on that. Can I do that? Oh, crap. I don't want to restart it. But back a couple steps, we would have seen that the, um, because we had the first two separated, right? The one and the two were empty on this side. And because this condition here says, while both of these have length, and since only one of them had length, right? One of them was, there weren't any items. We ended up just concatenating the left one and the right one. So we end up saving time there, right? Because we know that this is already in order. We don't have to go through those items again. This is one of the things that helps this be a little bit more efficient. Okay. Now we're at the point we're, we're back to our original call on merge sort in the call stack. This full array of eight items that we passed in, these are the two ways that we split it. We've split those two things already. So now what we get to do is since we have a left sorted and a right sorted, we pass those to merge. And you're going to see that we compare first and the second, or first one of each one. And so we have a one. And we put the two in, then we're going to put the three in, and we're going to put the three in, and we're going to four in, and the five. Five, and the six, six. and since we're at end, right? And it's going to console log. The result here. Not what I want. Ta da! That neat. And a hush fell over the crowd. 
Ben, your excitement was just overwhelming me. Did I just melt all of your brains? A little bit, maybe. Okay. CS does that. It's okay. That was helpful to see you break it down like that. The the breakpoints, I, I have them and I accidentally click on the red dots and I was like, I know this does something, but I don't remember. But <laughs> this is helpful to see how it works. Mm -hmm. Are the these... Way... Go ahead. Are these CS, um, like VS Code stuff? Is this in our GitHub repo? I'll put it in there. Uh, okay. You're going to have to establish your own breakpoints. But... Right, that's fine. Yeah, okay. I'll put Sweet. this code. I mean, here. Let's just put it in the class channel. Well, well I noticed there were other things too, so I was thinking instead of just throwing all of them in Slack. I, I, but. Yeah, I'm going to put them in, in, in the class channel. Uh, pro tip when you do use breakpoints, it's uh, helpful to put these in separate VS Code windows because if you put them in the same one, uh, you're going to have all the variables that you're watching. Like, if you want to watch a variable, you actually have to type it in here. Uh, so if you don't have uh, these typed in, it's going to watch them across the workspace. So it's helpful to have separate windows for each of the files that you're looking at. Um, so for example, if I want to watch, I mean, I already have all of these. Like if I want to watch unsorted array, I just click on plus here and say uh, unsorted array. And then it watch that value for me. That's how that works. It's helpful if you find examples of code that do that executes these different kinds of uh, searches or sorts or whatever you're trying to, to go through, put it in VS Code, set up some breakpoints so you can watch the, the variables as, as it executes and just track it and say, okay, what's happening next? Draw a chart if you need to. I mean, there are a bazillion different um, little images on the internet that show or that show this stuff actually happening. But like, just play, there's no reason you can't play around with it like this. You're gonna learn it. It's just tracing what happens, right? How the call stack works with recursion, things like that. Uh, ben, I have a question. Sure. So th those circles in the code are just keeping track of the uh, watching the variables, right? These circles are saying when I get to this point. No, no not those. Stop. The, the in, in the code, right? Right next to a uh, return array at the top, it has like a, a clear circle. Yeah, that little um, bit. Yes, yeah, those are showing. Uh, those are just saying they're extensions of the breakpoint, I think. I think that'll, let's see what happens if I start it again. Nope. I think you have to stop and start or restart yeah, it. Yeah, you're right. Let's run a debug again. Let's see what happens. I think it's just keeping track of what's happening on individual steps, so. I think it's like if you yeah. wanted to see like different steps throughout a line of code, you can add breakpoints within your lines. Yeah, I think that is 100% right. You can add breakpoints on every single executable thing that's happening. It is pouring outside. Cool. Any other questions about merge sort? There's, if you want a, another visual representation of sorts, there's a really fun um, uh, let's see here. Pull this up. Oh, I put it in the class channel last night. It would be easier to find it that way. We don't have anybody sensitive to seizures here, do we? Okay. Is this if David's you do, video? Come off a mute, please. Yeah, this is something that David shared. I do. 
Um, you do, but I'm not yeah. going to put. I'm not going to put it on then. So okay. <laughs> It's uh, it's not that bad, but it's uh, it essentially shows how I'll, I'll link it that way. If you want to watch it, you can watch it. Is it the sorting uh, graph thing yeah. that I've I've seen that that doesn't bother me. Okay. So this will show you the difference between different types of sorts, but it won't here. It actually makes funny sounds as it goes. So let's find a, oh, here's a, where's the actual merge? Here's merge sort. Oh. Okay. Come on. So you see how it's finding the halves and then merging the halves together. Then it does little halves, little halves, breaking everything into smaller little individual elements. And then every time it has enough elements, it merges everything together. And it's fun sound effects, right? I watched this for like half an hour last night before realizing there was sound. Oh, you're watching it without sound? I was watching your guys' or the David uh, N's lectures last night. And I just had this on in the background, just kind of watching it. I mean, it's not a fair one for one comparison. This reminds me of those uh, like uh, games where you have to build up, build up the numbers to like whatever. You have to like link, you have to put one and one together, then you have to put one and one together, then the twos and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. This is actually really fun to watch in double playback speed. So there's 79 different kinds of sorts on here. I could watch this for hours. But yeah. Oh, that one's cool. <laughs> anyway, all right, I'm done with this now. Um, that's March sort. I know I went a little bit over. Um, let's take a, take a little break. We'll come back. We'll talk about search, uh, searching. So how about take 10 minutes? <laughs> 